Okay, great. Um, I, yeah, I can't remember if it went to the cloud or went to whichever, but that's fine. I'll get it either way. <laughs> okay. Um, is it okay to start, Ms. Moisten? Okay. Mm -hmm. My name is Alicia Walker, and I am calling this meeting to order as co-chair. Governor Baker's extension of the March 12 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law allows us to hold this virtual meeting of the working group. Given that we have a quorum present, I am calling this July 15, 2021 meeting of the Community Safety Working Group to order at 5.33 p.m. I will call upon each member of the working group by name. At that time, they should unmute their mic and say present. This will indicate that they can hear me and we can hear them. Please remember to mute your mic after saying present. Ms. Pat Ananabaku. Present. Mr. Russ Vernon Jones. Present. Mr. Darius Cage. Present. Um, I want to take a couple of minutes to review the agenda. We will first hear any public comment that members of the public want to provide to the working group. We will not respond to your comments, but we will listen to your comments carefully. We will then hear comments from members who have something to report for this meeting. Uh, we have designated, um, oh, I apologize. Um, so let me just review the agenda. So for this week's agenda, we have um, first to hear from members who have met with Chief Livingstone regarding the Resident Oversight Board. Um, we want to continue the dialogue in regards to the Resident Oversight Board and specifically um, review membership requirements. Uh, we want to hear from members who are working on traffic control, make a list of requests and have a dialogue um, about Mr. Bockelman's emails. Um, and ha um, to the town council and have a dialogue regarding um, writing a letter in support of Amherst Media to the town council. So our first order of business is the public comment section of the agenda. If any members of the public would like to make a statement, please raise your hand. I will recognize you and ask Ms. Moiston to turn on your microphone. I ask that comments be limited to no more than three minutes. The working group will not be responding to your comments, but we will be listening carefully. Okay, yeah, I don't see any hands. Is it okay to move forward? Okay, great. <clears throat> uh, so this is the time for members to update us on any work they're doing or any events coming up. Does anybody have um, something that they would like to share at this time? Okay, well, um, so I will report to the group now uh, before we start that co-chairs, um, that as co-chairs, Ms. Owen and I have decided that the CSWG uh, will not meet with Mr. Irv Rhodes. Uh, we want to state that we are grateful for his feedback regarding the first part of our charge. However, our recommendations for the first part of our charge have been put in print, presented, and are in the implementation stages now. Uh, so because we are so limited with time, it is within the best interest of the group to ask Mr. Rhodes to please continue to engage in the second half of our charge by participating in public comment and emailing our group email um, to inform our work moving forward. Okay, and so with that being said, I would like to move to review the conversation um, that, oh, sorry, Ms. Pat. So um, while I respect the decision of the code uh, the co-chairs, what we discussed last week was we're supposed to get a vote. Today, you know, even if the vote fails, I guess um, I'm concerned about decision making. I know the, the vote will fail, but I, I think it's very important that we follow through whatever we discuss at meetings. Um, the way it looks like, it looks like the vote will fail anyways, but um, 
I'll just leave it up to the rest of the group members to see what they have to say in terms of input about this. Yep. Miss um, Moyston. Um, Alicia, I seem to have made you like the full host, which is fantastic, but could you give me the hosting abilities back so I can make you and Brianna co-hosts? I don't yeah. know how I did that. I... Sorry. I think um, it, you should be the host now. Okay. But um, Pat, didn't the majority of the group said that they didn't want to meet with them? No, no. no? Actually, actually, last week it was tied. Okay. It was three and three. Okay. Uh, based on condition, Deborah definitely said no. Uh, Mr. Ross abstained, and uh, Tashina stated that. It doesn't want to, but if majority wants to do it, it has to be public. So those are the three, I believe. And I want it public. And, and um, Alicia wanted public. I'm missing one person. Um, who am I missing? I'm missing somebody. But I, I record it was tied. And so we uh, moved it for today. It's just the um, decision making process is what I'm concerned about. I know the vote will fail, but just for the for, for community members or residents when you know people can watch our meetings sometimes, like it will be very confusing, like the group decided on something and then the following meeting, you know, another decision was made. It's not a big deal. At this point, it doesn't really matter to me anymore if we meet with him or not. I, I, I guess for me is the decision-making process is what I'm concerned about. I know our coaches, you guys have done a great job. Um, but I, yeah, so it's just the whole process. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Um, Mr. Vernon Jones. Um. Well, let me just say, given the things that I have learned since our last meeting and thinking about it more, I do not believe a public meeting would be productive. Um, so I'm prepared to back the decision of the co-chairs uh, and I would be happy to, to vote that way or, or simply to back their decision. Either way is fine with me. Um, if I might add, just because I don't see any other hands at this time, um, thank you for the comment, Ms. Pat, and I, I absolutely understand where you're coming from on that. Um, if it were more comfortable for you and the entire group agrees, I would, my alternative suggestion would be then to defer the vote till next week when all of the members are present. Um, just because we know we're not going to have Deborah present today. And um, I believe Tashina um, reached out and was unsure if she was also going to be able to make it today. Um, so if that is a more favorable option for the group, I would also be um, interested in discussing that. I mean... At this point, the vote is going to fail, even if we do it next week. What I'm, the concern I, you know, I voiced is our decision-making process. It's it's the only thing I know it will fail, anyways. So, I'm fine. We can move on. It's just yeah. Just for you know, anybody that watches our our meeting. You know, they watch previous one and then today and then coaches make another decision or maybe the language or maybe say like the coaches are thinking, you know, would like to recommend that we not meet with him. I think, you know, maybe the language. I don't know. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Yeah. Mr. Vernon Jones. I, I mean, I can see merits on both sides, uh, but 
I do believe that at the setting of the agenda of our meetings is the prerogative of the co-chairs. Yeah. Uh, so we're within normal procedures if they decide they don't want that on the agenda. If someone were to make a motion uh, to handle this differently, then we would have to, I think, vote on the motion. Um, but I think it's, uh, so either someone would have to move that we uh, have them and vote on it or the, the coach, otherwise the co-chairs have the right to set the agenda. But that, but that's not. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Miss Pat. Yeah, that's not what I'm saying, though. I'm not. I'm not disputing. You know who sets agenda. Everybody can contribute to agenda. It's not what I'm saying. Let's move on. You know, I'm okay. You know, for for us not not to meet with him, but just you know moving forward um, with this group in terms of decision making. That's the only thing. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Um, I do appreciate your comment and I understand um, the importance and significance of consistency and, and following through with what we say we're going to do. Um, so I do understand your concerns and wanting that to happen. And so I, I just want to make sure that it's okay with you and the other mm -hmm. members of the group that we move to the next um, agenda item. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And you know, you know, you guys, you know, Rihanna and Alicia, you know, I love you guys very, very much. So I, I'm saying this out of love, you know, yeah. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so I want to take the time to open the floor now uh, to Mr. Vernon Jones and Ms. Owen and myself to report back to the group takeaways uh, from the meeting we had today with Chief Livingstone in regards to the Resident Oversight Board um, and in hopes that this will help inform the next agenda item, which is continuing the dialogue on the Resident Oversight Board. We don't necessarily, or can you see the agenda? Yes. Uh, Oh, yes, I can see the agenda. We don't have to stay in that order, I just, but I didn't know if you were reading okay. the same agenda. No, sorry, I was not. Oh, public safety recruitment. I was mm. not on the same agenda, I apologize. Okay, so. It's just a simple email from Paul, but this was, I was asked to put this on the agenda. Okay, no problem. So we can take a minute to step back from my previous statement to visit the first agenda item, which is actually um, the email from Mr. Bockelman in regards to public safety recruitment and the posting of um, the, or the beginning of the hiring process for new police officers. Um, so I want to open the floor to dialogue for that now. Disappointed? Oh. Yes, Ms. Scott. Um, I'm frustrated. I'm disappointed. Um, but I'm not surprised at all. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Mr. Vernon Jones and then Ms. Owen. Uh, well, I appreciate Mr. Bachman letting us know this, um, but the recommendation of this group uh, was that no new police officers be hired and no vacancies be filled. And um, our thinking behind that was that uh, the police department has been functioning quite well uh, with 44 officers. Um, and if we are making a long-term transition to have the CREST program be a long-term program, um, leaving these positions vacant uh, in the police department would provide a more secure form of funding for the program, both for this year and for next year. Uh, so I do think this is a mistake to fill these vacancies and uh, unfortunate that the recommendation of our group was not uh, accepted. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Um, Ms. Owen? I also 
I also think it was a mistake and I'm very disappointed. I'm wondering if um, at this point, if he is going to move forward with it, if the CSWG or members from this group can be a part of the hiring process and the screening process. Because from my understanding, I was a little bit confused about people in the pipeline to be hired. And I thought that there was only one um, officer they had in mind who was still in the academy. So I'm, I'm a little bit confused on where everything is. And I think at this point, um, for me, I want to know if the CSWG can be a part of that screening and hiring process. So I will check with Paul tomorrow to see if you guys can be part of that hiring process. And there is one person in particular, but we have a rule where we have to advertise for 14 days regardless of what the position is once we have a vacancy we have to advertise that vacancy for 14 days in order to be able to hire one even if they have one designated person for even if you take it outside of the pd but just say we we're going to hire a new administrative assistant we have to and they already had someone in mind internally even we have to still post it externally for 14 days it's in the charter so that's where that process piece comes from, not to take away anything else that you said. Thank you, Ms. Moisten. Um, Mr. Vernon Jones. Well, not to jump agenda items here, but uh, while we were meeting with the police chief today, he indicated that in the past, the department had been interested in having representatives of the community be part of the hiring process. Um, so um, perhaps that could be, um, part of the communication and Mr. Bachman that we're partly responding to that um, statement by the chief in, a, in our volunteering to be part of this hiring process. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Um, yeah, so I also just want to take a minute to share my disappointment with the um, the notification that they will begin hiring to fill the vacancies. I feel worried that we haven't been able to successfully set up the resident oversight board yet or review the policies or do any of the preventative measures that I was hoping that we would be able to accomplish before um, these things would happen. So I'm just a little bit, um, yeah, disappointed to say the least, I think. Um, Ms. Pat? So um, I'm trying to keep my emotion in check because I have a lot to say. This is a town that claims that they don't have money to fund programs that will benefit BIPOC community. And yet, that is all of a sudden, there is money to recruit more police officers. We've never in this as a group ever said fire any police officer. We never said that. What we said, what we've stated consistently is if, I, if any police officers leave for whatever reason, whether it's due to retirement, not to replace them. And yet, Buck, uh, uh, the town manager did not listen to us. He, she, he is not listening to BIPOC community at all. What are we doing here? Wasting our time, frustrating us? I guess I'm not even understanding why we should even be part of the hiring process. It's our, it's our uh, uh, contribution or recommendation or suggestion will even be taken. I mean, if any CSWG member wants to be part of the hiring, good luck. But what is the point? They've never listened to us since we've been meeting. This is what we get. I'm just like, just, I'm full of like, really beyond frustration to say the least. And I'm, I'm trying to like, you know, get it together tonight. But this is just a slap, you know, on the face for BIPOC community. This is, in, this is not right, it's insulting. That we are begging for, youth empowerment program we are begging for multicultural program and this is what we get really ms is a town it's a it's a it's a tale of two towns the the powerful gets whatever they want 
and BIPOC, we, 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 we get ignored. How is that fair? How are we going to implement DEI in this town? Or is it one of the checkbox? Uh, we, you know, we did this, we check it out. Yeah, we're providing CREST program underfunded, check it out. Is that what we're here for? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Ms. Owen? I guess too, for me, something I'm a little bit confused about is was the police budget um, budgeted at 48 officers or 46? Because I was under the impression two police, two, um, police officers were going to retire. So if that's the case, where did the additional money for their salaries, where was that money found? Thank you, Ms. Ellen. Mr. Vernon Jones. My understanding is that for this past year, FY21, the APD was budgeted at 48 officers. Uh, and two of those positions were held uh, and two others became vacant. So they've been operating with 44. Um, and that the budget that the town manager submitted and the town council approved was for 46 sworn officers. Um, so the money is, and they're, so they're, at least as of the last count that was shared with us, they were two below that. And the budget was, that was passed had 46 sworn officers. So they have two vacancies. And we were told there was another retirement coming, but I don't know the status of that. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Okay, um, so for the second agenda item, we have priorities of part two um, of our charge to check in with the subgroups just for an update to see um, if there are any. Um, if anybody has anything to share, I would like to open the floor now. Ms. Pat. So with the, um, both the um, traffic control uh, subcommittee, last week we had talked about um, having that delayed like next week because Zebra will be on the road or something like that. There will be no report this week. But I believe um, Brianna had something to share, right? Yeah. Yeah, OK. Um, so I did a little bit of research on New York. And I did notice, I think it was LA was another city that is looking at traffic alternatives. But um, we have to obviously keep in mind that we're not New York City. So New York City suggested alternatives such as um, what they referred to as I believe, self monitoring streets. So they have traffic violations um, ticketed or citations given to people through cameras. So if you run a red light or you're speeding, a picture of you gets taken. I don't see that working in Amherst just because something that I learned today actually <laughs> was um, there are surveillance laws in place in Massachusetts that might not make this within reach. Another thing that New York City is looking to do um, based on this report that I read was um, reallocating funds from the NYPD to the Department of Transportation um, to um, increase investments in street designs and the self-enforcing streets. They talked about protected bike lanes because um, they are trying to move towards sustainability there and um, protect, protected um, intersections. So their definition of protected intersections was intersections with cameras and um, intersections that have the automated walk um, signal for pedestrians. Um, yeah. I don't, I mean, that was just like some research. I think what Ms. Pat put forward last week was the most realistic version of traffic control that's gonna work for Amherst. New York City is um, looking at traffic alternatives, so is LA, but these are really big cities with traffic issues and different issues that Amherst doesn't have. Um, another thing that was notable in this report though, was um, working on the Know Your Rights Bill from 2017 to get officers who are enforcing traffic violations to let people know their rights. I thought that was interesting 
interesting, but again, I'm not sure what bylaws in Massachusetts or in the town in general would prohibit something like that from happening. Thank you, Ms. Owen. Thank you, Brianna. Yes, and I do, oh, yep, Mr. Vernon Jones. Well, it's not exactly a, a subgroup report, but um, yeah. I did a little research into the community policing uh, issue and I did email two um, readings um, that I think would be helpful background for our uh, group. Um, and we don't, we don't have a subcommittee working on that, but I think it's a big enough issue that we probably be useful for all of us to be a little more informed. Uh, and uh, the chief also volunteered to share with us any documents that he's been using in, with regard to community policing. So it's just a, a future item. We don't need to talk about it tonight. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Ms. Owen? Um, Alicia and I were working on the community policing, Ross. I'm sorry, oh. we've just been oh, really busy. No, it's okay. Um, Alicia and I both reached out to Defund 413 to hear their perspective on community policing and hear what alternatives they may have. So we're hoping next week that we can meet with them and report back to the group. I think that the readings that you put forth to the group are awesome. And I think that if we could all answer the three questions you emailed us, we could have a discussion on it next week. Thank you, Ms. Ellen. Okay, so um, with that being said, I think Ms. Pat was right. We did decide um, that we were gonna give um, the groups a little bit more time to do some re research and do a more formal report back um, next week. So um, I did want to though move um, into an update on the conversation that Mr. Vernon Jones and Ms. Owen and I had this morning with the police chief in regards to the resident oversight board. Um, and so I want to open the floor now um, to see um, if either Mr. Run Jones or Ms. Owen wanted to begin a discussion on the meeting we had today. Brianna? Oh. I was muted, sorry. I thought the meeting went really well. I learned a lot of different things that I think are gonna be really important for a resident oversight board. Um, the chief explained more in depth what the um, accreditation means and why um, the Amherst Police Department is an accredited police department. The way he explained it to us was that um, our department being accredited is a way for checks and balances to operate within the department. There's two different types of accreditation, state accreditation and national accreditation. Um, national accreditation is like $10,000. And I think that's the limitation on why Amherst doesn't do it. But um, we are state accredited. And what that means is every three years, um, people from the state come in and review policies. And I guess they look for community feedback. So I think this piece of information was really important for me anyway, because I'm thinking about the resident oversight board. I think the resident oversight board needs to work with the state accredited agency to get community feedback. Um, I'm looking at my notes. Um, I thought another key point, another like thing that I learned from meeting with the chief was also um, that there are people special who receive specialized training to do investigations at the police department and they're usually people in leadership and they receive special training so i think that's even more of a reason for the resident oversight board to receive specialized training if we do want them to do investigations um, i learned that they don't have quotas however when grants are taken for things like um, pedestrian safety and whatnot, that there are quotas and things they need to meet. So I think moving forward with the resident oversight board, um, the resident oversight board needs to be mindful of grants taken on by the police department and the quotas and how that could be harmful to the community. Thank you, Ms. Owen. Um, I'm looking through my notes as well. So I think uh, two of the questions that the Chief brought up when we were reviewing the document. One was the question of um, subpoena power. And so I think that as a group that that might be something that we need to continue to look into and get a little bit of more information 
on um, specifically regarding the necessity of a bylaw if we do intend to um, have the group have subpoena power uh, because there are, there are just legal implications there. Um, so I think that's something we need to look more into and that's something that the chief brought up at our meeting. Um, and his other point out was just, um, well, I'm sorry, he said two things and I only wrote down that one. So, that's the only key thing. Uh, Mr. Vernon Jones, do you by any chance remember what the other thing is that he commented on? Um, oh, the contracts, sorry. Yeah. He, he said that he knew the contract fairly well, but he really couldn't answer the question about whether there were any problems that the current contract would pose for what we're proposing. Um, Can so you speak loud we a need little to bit? Do some research into the contract. Oh, sorry. Yeah, he he couldn't say for sure whether the current contract with the bargaining unit of uh, patrol officers would be would be a problem in any way. And but he encouraged us to um, to review that, and uh, I'll try to figure out some way to go forward with that. Um, and his, one of his questions about subpoena power was, are there any of these boards in New England that have it? There may be in, because the whole situation with unions and contracts and, and all is very different in different parts of the country. Um, but also now that, that with the uh, Police Reform Act that was passed last December in the state legislature uh, and signed into law makes not only the findings of internal police investigations public, but also the underlying documents uh, and the process is also now public by state law, available to the public by state law. So it may be that subpoena power is, um, is not as critical as we had originally uh, thought it might be, but you know, I'll, I'll try to explore that some more. Um, Overall, I have to say, I felt the, the chief was, you know, I mean, we read through this whole document with him uh, and, you know, we didn't get his final definitive response, but in general, uh, he was supportive of the idea of resident oversight, said that it's not in his interest to have officers who misbehave. Uh, and um, I, I felt he was, you know, remarkably open to what we proposed. Uh, you know, my, my fear was there was going to be some red flag in here that he was going to have a lot of trouble with. And I, I think the potential for moving forward with the chief is, uh, you know, we're, we're going to have to be vigilant and stay on top of it. But I think there's a real chance that we can make something significant happen here. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Ms. Pat? I just want to applaud and thank three of you for taking the time to meet with him. Absolutely, we need input from APD. And I'm happy that um, there was no red flag with what you know uh, we put together so far. And all the information that you guys just shared, I think is very helpful. Um, so thank you guys. Thank you very much. So is there like a follow-up meeting that you guys have with him or is the next step for him to come to a meeting or because I'm thinking more like Deborah who is you know who has like legal background as well so yeah I don't think we have made that decision yet I think we do need to continue the conversation with the police chief and we'll want to be in contact with him again and that as a group we can decide if we want to invite him to um if we want to invite him to meet or if we or Brianna and I and Mr. Vernon Jones meet with him again or something like that. Um, I think that those are all options and that we can we can make a decision. And the police chief also stated that he was in, in, interested in continuing the conversation. So we didn't schedule a follow-up meeting, um, but I think that there's interest on both sides. So that is a possibility. <clears throat> um, and then, yes, Mr. Vernon Jones. 
Yeah, I, I think the next step is for us to flesh out this proposal a little further. There's some things we don't have in here yet uh, and to investigate the thing about subpoena power and probably get a read of the contract. Um, so I think the, the ball's back in our court, but um, he's, he's ready to meet with us, I think, whenever we're ready. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones, Ms. Ellen, and then Ms. Pat. Uh, Ms. Pat had her hand up first. Oh, no, no, you, you actually, it was you. Are you Go sure? Ahead. 100%. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to follow up. Um, uh, Chief did say to look into what other um, neighboring cities and towns have. And I'm looking at the Springfield website right now, and their board is authorized to subpoena witnesses, compel their attendance, administer oath, take testimony of any person under oath, and require the production of evidence relating to any matter before the board or investigation. Nice. I, I can send the link to the um, group, and maybe we can have a, a, a longer conversation when all of our members are here next week. Great. Great. Thank you, Brianna. Uh, Ms. Pat? I'm wondering, are we going to have time to discuss about um, where we are at with the town in terms of uh, getting a researcher to help us? I wouldn't be comfortable for us to submit anything to the town manager and to the town council in November without, or end of October without us having um, some, you know, somebody or a group to help us with all this, uh, to do more in-depth research on uh, whatever our charge is to, to complete this. So do we know, are we going to discuss this tonight? It's, you know, we're moving forward to um, getting a researcher or what is the stat status? Um, thank you, Ms. Pat. So I believe at this time, we do not have a definite answer as to whether or not there will be funds available or um, whether or not we will be able to have a consultant, but, but we, it's not a no, it's just we don't have an answer. So I think if it's okay, I can, we can discuss this at the end of the meeting, um, our approach or what we want to do next when we get to the topics that weren't anticipated within 48 hours of the meeting, if that's okay. I will. Uh, um, yeah, just quick question yes. is, did, did anybody meet with Mr. Delaney at all? Was oh, they yeah. meeting? Did I, Thought we reported it at last meeting. I apologize. No, I don't think I we did. <laughs> okay, no. so I apologize. But um, that's what that's where I'm coming from. Okay, I understand. I apologize. So I thought we reported that at last meeting. Mr. Vernon Jones and I were able to meet with Mr. Delaney. Um, and I think that when we finish this conversation, we'll discuss the second part of the RFB and that we can update you all on the conversation that we had. I apologize, Ms. Pat. Okay, mm -hmm. that's all right. Mm -hmm. um, I, and unless there are any other hands. <clears throat> okay, I just wanted to also bring up a couple of other things, um, notes I have here from the meeting that Brianna and I, oh, and Mr. Vernon Jones had this morning. Um, the, the chief also did let us know because we have something in here to, um, in regards to the authority of the board to make recommendations in regards to discipline. Um, the chief did let us know that ultimately that is the town manager's decision and that the chief himself only has the authority to suspend um, an officer for up to three days. And so that anything more severe than that is under the discretion of the town manager. And so I think that's also important information to keep in mind just in regards to the wording um, of our charge and what type of responsibilities we give to the resident oversight board. I think that that's just important also to acknowledge. And Um, and yes, and I think we need to also have a conversation about uh, funds for the Resident Oversight Board, because I know this is something that um, Mr. Bockelman has expressed the interest to move on quickly. And so I think we want to keep in mind in that, that in the implementation process that we don't yet have confirmed stipends for the members, nor do we yet have confirmed funds for investigators or other things that we indicated we would want funding for. So I think those are just things to keep in mind. Oh, 
Okay, and um, unless um, Mr. Vernon Jones or Ms. Owen, if there's any other key ideas that we missed from today's conversation. Uh, Ms. Owen? One thing that I thought was interesting and I definitely wanna follow up on for traffic control is that um, the chief did say that the second that the lights on the the police vehicle go on that it starts recording so that the information about how many stops have been made and the number of stops fines and written and verbal warnings could be available. I think that um, we should pursue that while talking about traffic alternatives because I'd be interested to know more. I know that we did get the information a long time ago, but just to figure out how many traffic stops are happening in Amherst and how much money we could save from alternatives. Thank you, Ms. Owen. Are they, will they also release the race of people they are stopping? I mean, if they're going to. Yes, Ms. Pat. Okay. Um, I mean, it's great if they're going to release, um, and, and they should, but are they going to release by race? That's my question. Yeah. If they're, if they're going to be releasing um, traffic, traffic stop, they should also release by race because that's, that's the main point is the whole point of you know, wanting to reform the police. You know, BIPOC folks are, are stopped more than white people. So I hope you know, the, the chief will be able to provide us with race as well. The racial, uh, yeah. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Mr. Vernon Jones. Yeah, the chief had, they, months ago, they did provide us with some racial data. Uh, and what we agreed today is we would look at what we've received and see whether it meets our needs or whether we need something else. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. <clears throat> so I think that um, in terms of moving forward on the resident oversight board, uh, Mr. Vernon Jones, I think it would be helpful for all of us to take a look at what Mr. Vernon Jones has sent to us all um, and that we, oh, I want to have a conversation in regards to the membership also um, to see if that's something we can make a decision on now because as it stands, the draft that we presented to the police chief today, we didn't put definite numbers in it in terms of how many members will be on the resident oversight board or in terms of the percentage of BIPOC um, people. So I would like to discuss that or open that up to the group to see if we might be able to come to a decision on that. Ms. Pat? Actually last week I remember that uh, majority of people agreed to seven member with five BIPOC folks last week. It's, it's what I recalled. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Mr. Vernon Jones? Well, Ms. Pat, I remember you proposing that. I don't remember that we actually had a discussion or, or took any kind of vote. We didn't poll everybody about it. Uh, and I think some of what we learned with the chief may, might inform this discussion. Yes, um, Ms. Owen? Um, what, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say that I am in agreement that I do remember that being proposed at last meeting, uh, but that we didn't get to have a really thorough conversation. And so I just did want to bring that back up now. Sorry, and Ms. Owen, you can go ahead if you still would like to make a comment. Um, one of the things that the chief said was just that there might be competition between recruiting members for the Human Rights Commission and the Resident Oversight Board. Um, so I guess after he said that, I was thinking a seven member board might be hard to get the stipends for seven people, but five might be easier. I'm in total agreement that it needs to be majority BIPOC, but I also just want to make sure that people who are on this board are fairly compensated for the amount of work that we're asking them to do. So that's why I'm just a little bit worried about it being seven people. In an ideal world, if the town manager could support our recommendation, I think splitting this type of work among seven people and fairly compensating them would be ideal. Thank you, Ms. Owen. Ms. Pat? I honestly 
Yes, you know, the chief has a, a point there like competition between Human Rights Commission. First of all, I was very shocked to find out a couple of months ago that Human Rights Commission shunners are not being compensated. They should, why, why wouldn't they be? And in terms of it for the oversight board, I think it will be the hardest committee in this town, just because of the nature of the work and charge that they're going to be dealing with. And so I worry about five member committee in terms of majority of BIPOC is what I worry about. To have, um, you know, three, the, the proposal by Mr. Ross was three BIPOC and two whites. Am I correct about that? What, what, the proposal was at least three, uh, five member committee with at least three BIPOC. Yeah, I, I don't feel comfortable with that. So, I mean, I like seven so that if we have five BIPOC and somebody decide to drop, we still have enough majority of BIPOC people. I'm just, I'm just worried about if we don't have, if, that, if at some point we don't have enough BIPOC majority, that will worry me about the existence of the oversight board. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Um, I think that's an interesting perspective just because I didn't, we did talk about um, retention, which is also a concern that I have, especially after meeting with the chief, and that if, if we are able to fill the board, which is also another concern, that how can we make sure that they stay on the board and that there's not burnout and all of those things. Um, but I do recall somewhere in the document that it does state that if there is not a majority BIPOC that then the board would not function? Um, Mr. Vernon Jones? Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm also concerned about keeping the board majority BIPOC and keeping it, the positions filled with BIPOC folks. And um, I, you know, filling us three slots or will be easier than filling more than that. What I proposed and what we put in writing and shared has been shared with this group and with the chief is that if we, for instance, we had a five member committee with uh, three BIPOC members and a BIPOC, uh, a vacancy existed in one of the BIPOC positions. So let's say a BIPOC members resigns that the two remaining members would still have three fifths of the vote. In other words, the voting power of the BIPOC block remains the same regardless of whether there's a vacancy or not. So they can still out, even with a vacancy or two, they can still outvote the white people. Um, and the, the, if it had no BIPOC people, it could not function. But even with a BIPOC vacancy, it could vote with the BIPOC folks having their votes count more than the white votes. Thank you for that clarification, Mr. Vernon Jones. Ms. Pat? I would like to recommend that we table this till next week when perhaps we'll have more, more of the members present. Um, alternatively, I mean, if people want five members, to me, the compromise has to be four BIFOC and one white resident. I am very uncomfortable with three, only three BIPOC member. It has to be four and one white. Otherwise we need to really, you know, weigh the advantage and disadvantage of five member or seven member. The only reason why seven gen recommended the five member is to ensure that the town compensate those members fairly well and I'm not speaking for them, but for me is, it's going to be really hard to recruit people to this board. And we're not, we cannot guarantee that people will not leave. I think we have to be careful not to set this board up for failure. It's not going to be easy for BIPOC to join this group. So um, even when people leave, we still have enough majority to carry out the charge is where I'm coming from. I'm not worried about whether the town 
has money or not, because I know the town has money. We got a lot of money from the federal stimulus money. So 10 grand for each member is not a big deal. So I'm not worried about the money piece. The town nickel and dime issues, matters that impact BIPOC communities. So we shouldn't even be discussing about we don't have money. We, we have the resources. We pay a lot of everybody, renters and homeowners, everybody in this town pay a lot of taxes. So there is, there is resources to, to fairly compensate um, the oversight board, whether they are five or seven. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Um, so with that being said, I want to ask how the group would like to proceed with this. Um, I am okay with, with tabling this until next week when all of our members sh um, should be present, but I am also an okay with engaging if there are people who wish to continue the conversation. Okay, um, well, just because I haven't had any input, I'm going to table this conversation, um, the further conversation on the numbers to next week when there are more members present, and then maybe we will also have some more time to think about things. Um, I would like to move to the next agenda item, which is the RFB phase two. Um, and so Mr. Vernon Jones and I can update you all on our meeting with Mr. Delaney. Um, so I guess I can just start off by saying that I, I think the meeting was very informative. Um, Mr. Delaney was able to provide us with a lot of information regarding what our options are. Um, and so we can share that with you all, but I, just to give a def definite answer to your question is that we still have not received a yes or a no in terms of if we will be able to get a consultant. Um, and we also do not have a dollar amount on that yet either. So what we have, what we did get from, was information from Mr. Delaney in regards to what our options would be if we do want to um, hire a consultant and that there are a number of different processes we can take. There is the IFB, the, the IFP, the RFB, and um, we can also solicit bids, um, we talked about the possibility of hiring somebody, uh, one person that we would choose um, and putting them on, well, if that would happen that we would be required to put them on town payroll uh, and that would be in terms of an hourly, paying somebody hourly for the work, um, but that there are dollar requirements also to each option. And so I think that, the, that those are only options if we're going to spend under $10,000. Um, Mr. Vernon Jones, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, okay. Um, and so I'm not sure if how else to proceed right now without an answer as to how much money we will be able to use or if any at all. Um, and so I think that I would like the group's feedback in terms of what we would like to do for next steps. If we would like to reach out to Mr. Bockelman um, or how we would like to proceed. Um, Ms. Pat and then Ms. Owen. So first of all, again, high energy people. Uh, Mr. Ross, Alicia, thank you again you know, for your time for, you know, meeting with Mr. Delaney. As a businesswoman, I'm very puzzled why a town official will say that, you know, getting a researcher will have to be, uh, will, will have to be converted as a town employee type of thing. Like they have to get paid hourly, whatever. You know, I would think that researcher you know, comes under the status of a contractor. So I'm not understanding that. I can tell you right now, I would be very hesitant for any town employee to help us with this um, work. I want neutral, independent, 
whatever we, we end up calling them farm a researcher or people who studied the, the, the research before. And I do not want anyone that have any type of police background to help us either. So I'm just, I'm just stating my own opinion. Uh, I'm not speaking for the group, obviously, but um, so I'm kind of puzzled by that, by putting somebody on payroll, if they are independent um, contractor, they work the, for themselves. And then because they decide to do research for us, we put them on, on town payroll. I, I don't understand that. I don't get that. Maybe there's something I'm missing, but that's not my understanding when you're dealing with contractors. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat. I apologize. It was because I gave a very brief overview and I didn't really go into detail, but mm -hmm. we have presented Mr. Delaney with a list of questions um, beforehand because we were unsure if we were going to be able to actually meet with him in person because the meeting was rescheduled. Um, and so one of the specific questions we were asking was, whether or not it would be a possibility to work with somebody at an hourly rate, because I think oh, okay. one of our concerns at this point is the budget and the fact that we don't know how much money we're going to be allowed to use. And so we're trying to, to explore what our options would be in terms of being conservative with money, but still being able to work with a consultant. So, so I actually feel like uh, okay. Mr. Delaney was really, really unbiased in the way that he shared information with us and he kind of just laid out what are all of our options were okay. and not that that would necessarily be a good option but just that that is an option and if we were to decide to hire somebody at an hourly rate because of um how that works we would have to put them on the town's payroll in order to pay somebody hourly um there was another option though that i i apologize i forgot to say is that there is an option of if we knew that we had specific sections of what is now an IFP that we could group and we would know that one person specifically could work on this group of questions that might require a different skill set than this group, um, that we could hire multiple different um, consultants under $10,000 to do those sections. If we were to redo it in that way, that's also an option. Um, so we were just really looking at all of our options. And, and so that was one of the things that we had specifically asked to see if that would be a possibility. I apologize for the very vague um, update okay. at the beginning. So this is, yeah, this is very helpful, very much. So, you know, I appreciate you guys trying to be conservative, but at the same time, we have to be realistic. Are we going to get anybody to even do it if they think that they're not going to be compensated for their time? We have to be respectful of people's time. So, but thank you guys though for your effort. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Pat. And I, I was just confused about employee payroll, you know, going into town payroll. I was very, very confused about that. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry, Ms. Pat. Um, That's okay. And Mr. Vernon Jones, I'm sorry. You also had your hand up, I think. I looked over you. Yeah, well, I think you you clarified some of what I was going to say. Um, you know, I, I hate to say this, but I think the town manager is still waiting to hear from us again about which path we want to take and what our priorities are for the information we want. Um, the IFB, you know, as we talk through the timelines, even if we had a decision today to go forward with it, it would probably be two months before somebody was actually hired. By the time you go through writing it and posting it and giving enough time and then, you know, and an RFP might be um, even slightly longer than that. So where are we now? We're in the middle of July, August, September. We're, we're talking middle of September would be the earliest if we move forward right away. Uh, it doesn't leave much time for somebody to do the work. It's also, we have in my, based on what Mr. Delaney told us, it seems like we have less ability to make sure we have a BIPOC uh, person uh, if we're using either an IFB or an RFP. Um, and for me, one of the appeals of this uh, contracting with somebody for under $10,000 is that uh, we can choose, uh, or the town can choose, uh, 
uh, who we want and we can make sure we have a BIPOC person with the qualifications we're interested in. Um, I think, and, and, and we, we can reach out to people or we can post and have people apply. Um, I think it would, what we'll get is we'll get $10,000 worth of work. Uh, and, you know, if we think that can be sufficient for what we need in the areas, or maybe we can get, maybe we can divide it in a way that we could get two people, uh, two of these. I don't know, it's, the work is pretty similar. Um, but I think we need to decide what we want to request from the town manager at this point in terms of timeline and method and what the scope of the work is. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Ms. Pat and then Ms. Owen. So I think Mr. Ross suggesting a researcher last week, I think I really, really like that. You know, that's what where I'm leaning towards. I think we should, you know, for the sake of time, we should definitely think seriously about going the route of researcher. Yes, under $10,000, can we have multiple under $10,000 for with group topics? Instead of dividing on uh, 10,000, can we have under 10,000 for groups of topic, another under 10,000, something like that, so that we can actually attract, you know, people to actually help us do the work. I'm not opposed to, you know, us going the route of research. I mean, that's the most realistic, practical thing to do at this point. You know, you know, time is very precious. So yeah, it will be the quickest way to get help. So I'm, I'm agreeing with, uh, with you, Mr. Ross, that I'm wondering if it's possible so do under 10,000, like, you know, like that 10,000 multiple to different researchers or something like that. Did you guys get a sense of that from Mr. Delaney or is he saying the 10,000 only? Um, Please Mr. clarify, yeah. Sorry, Mr. Vernon Jones. The way I understood Mr. Delaney was that if the two pieces of work that we want done require different skill sets or different experience, then we could split it into two contracts and go up to 10,000 on each of them. But if one contractor could do both, if the same skill set covered the full range of what we want, we can't arbitrarily divide it in half. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Uh, Ms. Owen. Question, um, I wasn't here last week. Where did the $10,000 come from and how did we go from an RFP to $10,000 in individual research? Um, so that number actually just came from Mr. Delaney in terms of what our limit would be for that process. So if we decide to take that process, that's our limit. Um, of course, with an, um, an RFP, our limit would be higher, but that's a different process. And at this point, we were saying that we don't believe that in terms of time that that would make sense to go that route or that it would be effective or that we would even have the funds to go that route. So we were exploring just other options and the other available options had a limit of up to 10,000. So um, splitting it, if we were able to identify two different skill sets and do both of those contracts for under 10,000. That's just an option. Uh, we could do, if we could figure out three different sets of skill sets, we could split it into three different groups that they would still all have to be under 10,000, if that makes sense, uh, Brianna, to answer your question. Okay. Um, and then in regards, I think Ms. Pat, you asked a question or you sent, stated something about wanting to go the researcher route. Um, so I'm definitely in agreement that we need some type of consultant or some type of person to work with us um, in regards to some information that would be, a, that would require certain expertise to really evaluate and look into. Um, and so I think this is where we have to decide which route we want to take in order to retain that researcher. And so what we were saying is if we were to pay a researcher hourly, 
then in order to do that, that the process would be, we would have to put them on the town's payroll. If we wanted to do a contract, we could do it for under 10,000. So those were just the different options. Um, and so I think Mr. Vernon Jones is right. And I think that as a group, we would want to decide that if we want to come up with a decision that we present to Mr. Bockelman so that we can get a definite answer um, in terms of what we're actually looking to do and what route we want to take now. Ms. Pat? So to get this correctly, this is just a scenario. So we group our topics into three. And, and then we get, you know, people with that skill set. And then one person said, I can do this for 9,000. Somebody else, you know, another group of topics said, they can, I can do it for seven. I'm just throwing out numbers. Mm -hmm. Another person can say, I can do this for uh, 9,500. So we're not splitting 10,000 10, into three. We're just doing under 10,000, correct? I want to be clear. Well, so we're not, so if we have three different um, categories of topics that requires three different skill sets, I'm just giving an example. Are we going to be split, splitting 10,000 by these three researchers or are we going to have each researcher bid under 10,000. I want to be clear. Yes. Mr. Vernon Jones, did you want to answer that question? Well, I can try, but based on my understanding, um, if the expertise required is sufficiently different, um, then we presumably could go up to 10,000 uh, each for two different contractors, say. So be 20 altogether, 20,000 altogether. Yeah. Now, if, okay. and, but only if we can, only if it's clear that it's different kind of work. If it's a similar kind of work, then it's against the law to split it that way. Okay. But if we're going this route, we don't have to take bids. We can say, we can call somebody up and say, will you do this? And we can say, we're ready to pay you uh, $9,999 and would like you to do this, this, and this. Will you do it? Um, so we don't, we don't have to go to bids or quotes or, or anything. And we can, the beauty of it is we can pick the person we want if we can find the right person. Now, I, I will say that the town manager expressed an interest in having somebody with expertise in the content area, not just generic research skills. Um, but I don't think, I mean, he's not committed to it being a police person. He just wants somebody who's already done a bunch of the work and knows the field. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Um, Can you explain knowing the field? I'm sorry. Sorry. Well, it's okay, Ms. Pat. So what do they mean by, you know, knowing the field? I don't understand. Yeah, I, I don't think I really know for sure what he means. I think the idea was somebody who had had some experience either with what other cities and town, who already knew something about what other cities and towns are doing in the area we're interested in, um, or had in-depth experience with with one place that had done all the things we're interested in. I mean, I think it could be a variety of different things, but it was somebody who already had done some work with regard to police reform or the kinds of questions we're raising. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Um, Ms. Owen, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, I guess I was kind of curious of the same thing, just because the only, I mean, I think the only one that I knew of was reading through um, one that was called Campaign Zero. I would feel kind of comfortable if we could consider bringing back our old consultants for part of the work that we have. But if we need someone who has experienced police background or experience digesting the police data, I don't know if we're gonna get it for that price because I, I could be wrong. I think they're called Campaign Zero does mm -hmm. similar work, but the, the, they're expensive. 
they're very expensive. And I think that $10,000, just saying that out loud, that's not that much money for a research project. I just don't know how we went from RFP to this, but I get why. And I like that we get to choose who. I just feel a little bit concerned, I guess. Thank you, Ms. Owen. Uh, Ms. Pat? So, you know, a couple of things. And again, um, and, you know, this is um, white perspective. You know, I, I can't come up with the right word to use. You know, the term experience in the field who have done experience with police reform is in a way already trying to weed out some people. I don't particularly um, buy into that as an employer. You'd be surprised people who don't have profit, you know, experience in a particular field, but you know, have the potential to do stuff. As a business person, if I bid for a contract and I win and I don't have all the skills, I hire people to help me out. That's the way it works. If it's a nursing care, I hire an RN to help me with the, you know, with the contract. That's just an example. But to say that, you know, we have to go looking for a researcher that already have done work on police reform really, you know, rubbed me in a very wrong way. This is an indirect way of weeding people out. And, you know, being an employer, I know I've given so many people, you know, chances and they've proven themselves like beyond expectation. So I think it's time for employers, you know, and I am putting town included to really, you know, drop the whole idea of, you know, experience, except for certain jobs that requires, you know, licensing like accountant or, you know, a nurse or something like that. But, you know, if somebody is a researcher, they know better to get help if they, you know, have question about union, how union works or legal question, they're not stupid. They will get the resources they need. I am leaning towards getting seven gen back to get this work done for us. Let me just put it out here. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Ms. Owen. Yeah, I agree with um with what with what Miss Pat said, and I think another like more important skill set that our next um, consultants or whoever we work with are going to have have to have is an understanding of the law, because I think that we can make whatever recommendations we want, but if they're if they don't um, fall within bylaws in the town and state, they're not going to be able to be implemented. So I think that's more important than to me than having done police reform more before. Thank you, Ms. Owen. Um, and so I, am, I also agree that we may want to talk more about the qualifications that, that we would want a consultant to have that we work with. Um, but I also just want to remind you all that the town manager will have to sign off on it regardless of what we decide in order for us to move forward. And so I do think it would be um, in our best interests to either have a document or a request to send to him directly or to um, have another conversation with him in regards to this so that we can make a decision and be confident that we will have support and it will move forward. Ms. Owen. One thing I want to suggest, just because I feel like very, not confused with the content of this meeting, but I kind of feel like we're running in circles because there's so many unanswered questions. I think that if the group was comfortable, um, Alicia and I could meet with Mr. Bockelman because there's so many um, unanswered questions, like how much money can we spend on consultants? What is the actual budget for that? What is the budget for the resident oversight board? What is happening with the police vacancies? Can we be a part of that process? Um, and then again, the budget for Cress. One thing that Irv brought up to the group two weeks ago that was in the packet and that he kind of explained to Alicia and I is that if um, money from the CARES Act is used, then there is a deadline that that money needs to be spent by. So I'm hoping that the town manager didn't budget that money for Cress and then that date comes up and it's not used for Cress. But I could be wrong. I guess I'm very confused on the process and I would feel more comfortable 
if the group allowed Alicia and I to talk to Mr. Bockelman because I'm feeling really uncertain and confused about this process. And there's just too many unanswered, on, not unanswered, but unanswered and unclear questions. Thank you, Ms. Ellen. Mr. Vernon Jones. I support our co-chairs having such a meeting and trying to work it through. Ms. Pat? I agree. Okay. Um, and so I don't know, uh, let me see. <clears throat> Can I ask for your thoughts on this, Mr. Cage? Um, I agree as well. Okay. Um, so I'm okay with that thought as well. And I think it would be very important for us to get some of the answers to these questions so that we can move forward. Um, so I would absolutely be in agreement to meet um, with Brianna and Mr. Bockelman, Mr. Vernon Jones. Uh, just one thought about when you meet with him, if it appears that we can't get good consultant help for the full range of things that we had in that IFB document, if we could get good help for some of them, uh, then we could focus our energies on um, addressing the others. I mean, obviously I want everything, um, but uh, I think we need to, you will run into some, some difficulty, I'm sure, and I'd, I'd want you to feel uh, that you've got our support to go ahead and get as much as you can. Uh, and we'll work hard to fill in what, what you can't get. Um, but let, let's not go back and forth, you know, a lot more times or you know, the time is, you know, disappearing. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Um, so I think Ms. Pat. So very quickly, I am wondering if, um, Perhaps we should email Ms. Marston to make suggestions as to the topics that we would like to group. I don't know if we have enough time tonight uh, to deliberate on that, but my, my thinking, for example, in order for town council and town manager to take our recommendation seriously, I would very much like a researcher to also help us research on the oversight board, on the traffic control, on the community policing, on the... Um, that's one more topic that we chose to like support the work we're doing. So that's one, one researcher to work on that. And then maybe we can look into the, um, the police uh, contract. That might be like, you know, another, all that stuff, you know, done for us. So that when we do our recommendation, we said, yes, you know, we have, you know, uh, researches that was made to back to back our recommendation is what I'm thinking in the line like that. Yep. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Um, I was also going to just suggest um, that we make a list, if you all are okay with that, of topics for Brianna and I to discuss with the town manager, just to make sure we're touching on all of the things that you all wish to have answers to. Um, and so I do know that we want to know our budget for consultants um, and for the resident oversight board. Are there any other things that you guys would like answered or you would like us to address with Mr. Bockelman? Um, Mr. Vernon Jones. I thought Brianna had a good list a couple minutes ago. Brianna, can you lay out the rest of that? Yeah, so for me, and I asked him via email, but I didn't get that clear of an answer. I think that we really need to have a conversation on the budget for CRESS and where that budget is coming from, because if that money is coming from CARES Act money, it's going to expire. And if it's going to expire, I would rather see that money go to the Resident Oversight Board. I also wanted to bring up the police vacancies. I'm very disappointed that he is hiring, but I think that Ms. Pat also brought up a great point. If we even are part of the hiring process, who is to say that our recommendations and our input will be taken seriously? But I, I still do want to be a part of that if he's going to go forward with it. Okay, thank you, Ms. Owen. Um, so I want to make sure everyone's in agreement with those things and that nobody else has anything else to add. Except for what I just said that, you know, for us to have, you know, subgroups of topics as, you know, because with 10,000, if, if we're expecting somebody to do 
all of them, that would not be possible. Just to get input from the town manager, will he be okay if they're like three separate um, uh, award to be given to researchers on three different topics? Yeah, groups of topics, yeah. Okay, so just to get more clarity on how we can break it up if we do separate contracts and yeah. if that would be some, okay, yes. Okay, thank you, Ms. Pat. Okay, so I would like to move to the next agenda item, which is recommendations from part one of charge to follow up on. Um, I don't know if anybody has any comments to make in regards to that. Sorry, Miss Pat, was that a hand? No, what, what, what is it that we're looking at again? I'm sorry. No, it's okay. The recommendations from part one of the charge, if there's any follow-up. Um, Miss Owen. One thing that was brought up like a long time ago, uh, Ms. Moisten sent us over some recommendations when we first started our charge. And I thought about it because um, the community policing, and I think that we should add to our um, list of recommendations is that whatever community policing that we decide to implement, that we make sure officers who speak Spanish are assigned to Spanish speak to areas that have Spanish speakers, something, something of that nature. And I'm not sure how many other um, officers in the department speak different languages. I'm pretty sure the chief sent over that information. So I'll circle back to that. But I just didn't want that recommendation to be forgotten. Thank you, Miss Owen. Mr. Vernon Jones. Well, I know that the town manager was more interested in our doing part one and just the resident oversight board in part two. Um, but it seemed to me that uh, the things we're talking about with regard to traffic control are really alternatives to policing or alternatives to police and public safety. So in a sense, they could be seen as part, as part of part one of our charge. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Um, I agree with that, but I still think that it would be important for us to include that in the second part of our oh, charge and absolutely. that we can just indicate that, that it is still a recommendation. Yeah. So I think, yeah. But thank you for bringing that up, Ms. Owen. Another thing that we just briefly talked about was the possibility of reforming or looking at the Human Rights Commission. Is that something the group wanted to, to look at or look into or I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, well, I just wanted, I want to say that that we did touch on that very briefly at our meeting with Chief Livingstone today. And so I don't I don't fully know what the Human Rights Commission does. And I think that is something that I, I would like to look more into in terms of what their, their responsibilities are um, because I, I don't know if there will be overlap with the Resident Oversight Board, if it would be in their best interest to work together on some occasions or to be two completely separate things. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, but those are things that I'm thinking about. I, don't know if anybody else has any input on those things. Ms. Ms. Marston. So I staff or I'm the human rights coordinator. So I can tell you that originally it was charged with doing investigations, not the police investigations have always been separate from any of the other, like if you'd gone into town hall and had a bad experience and wanted to complain, although you could come to the Human Rights Commission about police complaints, but they, police complaints have typically or should have been going through the chief. We have had a, a few that have come to the Human Rights Commission. Um, 
but the problem with any complaint going to the Human Rights Commission is, as we all know, was that it's during open meeting. And even if it's during executive session, if you have more than three people that are there, somebody is going to know it, one person didn't leave. So um, what has happened was we've decided to we take the, the complaint. We haven't honestly had any HRC complaints that have come out to be complaints, and that could be for many reasons. But um, myself and the human resources director have been investigating whatever complaint that has come forward, whether it come out to be human rights violation or not. And then we report that back to the Human Rights Commission. The thought is that if we do that and then say we've had four complaints about treatment to BIPOC community members at CVS, then the HRC knows that they need to do address the CVS, if that makes sense, right? So um, now they are more sitting as an education body, but at our Human Rights Commission retreat, they will be discussing how they wanna move forward as a group. So. Thank you, Ms. Moyston, yep. Ms. Ellen, and then Ms. Pat. How come they're not paid? You guys are the first commission to be a group to be paid. None. Of, yeah. Thank you, Ms. Ellen. Ms. Pat? Actually, the school committee get, gets stipend, the town council gets stipend, and the, um, the newly, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the homeless trusts, you know, I think it's a town committee also gets stipend. The Amherst Affordable Housing Trust? Yeah, gets stipend. And um, I was listening actually to town council meeting, the most recent one. And in fact, there are some committee in this town that doesn't have to be open meeting, that doesn't have to um, be required to follow open meeting law. So Human Rights Commission is something that I'm very passionate about because I know good people who serve on that commission and who could do like really good work, but they are so constrained. And I feel that there is no need to have Human Rights Commission uh, to follow open meeting law because of the investigative um, responsibility that they have. The fact that they have open meeting law because they have to abide by open meeting law may even deter people, you know, going forward to, to fight complaint, like Ms. Marston rightly stated, you know, even with the executive session, it will be obvious if you know two or three people are still there, they will know that they're complainant. So one of the things I would like CSWG to think about and push for is to um, waive Human Rights Commission from open meeting law so that they can get their work done. And secondly, to be compensated. You know, some of them have young children, you know, they can get childcare for that. Some, you know, it could be a night that they can, you know, um, order food out and prepare for their meeting. So the whole idea of having town uh, committee volunteering for free, I don't agree with that. The town have resources, you know, uh, the stipend, you know, will help people to pay for childcare or get meal the night of the meeting or whatever. So I, I think uh, this is that uh, Human Rights Commission, like they supported us. Um, they came, you know, and, you know, uh, spoke at our uh, open uh, public forum. They've been very supportive of CSWG. This is our time to also, you know, support them. We need change with that board. So I think we should put it in our recommendation that one, be exempt from open meeting law and secondly, for them to get stipend. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Okay. Oh, but I don't think that the resident oversight board conflicts with the Human Rights Commission. Okay, thank you. If, yeah, if you're going to keep all, if if the resident oversight board is going to deal with complaints about PD specifically, then the Human Rights Commission can deal with the complaints that come in from residents, people who are employed and are passing through the town of Amherst or in school. Can I ask what the stipend is for the Human Rights um, Commission? 
Nothing. They don't get anything. They're not stipend. There's no stipend. Nothing. So no one is stipend except for the, except for you guys. The town councils and executive. I mean, I so I don't consider the school board and the town council to be. They are boards, but they're not. They're though they're more executive side, executive led, and these boards are more. Uh, what do you say? Recommendations to the town manager. I don't know. I don't see them the same. Okay, thank you, Miss Marston. Miss Pat. Yes, Miss Marston. I'm not trying to negate what you just said. Or mm -hmm. um, I guess that's why I'm self-employed. So the whole like executive this, executive to me, it's like we're serving the community. There should not be any difference. difference. Yeah. I'm sorry. What about the housing, the housing authority? Do they get stipend? Are they, they are the also housing authority is not part of the town of Amherst. I know they're, they're quasi, they're quasi um, government, governmental, yeah, yeah organization. Yeah. So I don't know what they, I don't know if they get stipends or not. Yeah, but, but, you know, people have to run for election, you know, to get in there or get appointed by the governor. But my point is whether you're, school counselor, um, a town con council, or school committee, or CSWG or human right, people should get stipend. That's the way I look at it. So this, this, all this hierarchy thing, I don't buy into it. I'm sorry. Well, it wasn't so much of a hierarchy and I do believe everybody should be stipend because yeah. not everybody can afford and that could be one of the barriers why not so many BIPOC community members are involved is because yeah. you know you're talking like oh a shift at work or can I yeah. go to this meeting or yeah. the money that I have to pay for childcare. I mean yeah. I, I understand that. I think the way that I look at it is some are elected and some are appointed right. So school committee town council members are all elected and all the other boards are appointed. So you go through an interview process with us. It's not necessarily, a, it's just some are elected and others are appointed, but all of them deserve to be compensated if you ask me. Okay, so we're saying the same thing, but in a different way. I, yeah. I'm not, I'm not yeah. prioritizing anybody yeah. over anything. I'm just okay. saying that they're, they're yeah. Thank you, Ms. Morris. So election have consequences. So if we want all the committees in this town to the stipend, whoever is listening, consider running for election to change status quo. We need, we need a lot of changes to be done in this town, a lot. No, I and I think I said that in my talk with the League of Women Voters is that yes. this group, one of the things about CSWG that has brought to the forefront is that there's many of things that might have, this might have been how every other department or every other board or committee does it. And this might have been how it works for every other board and committee, but maybe that way needs to change, right? Like that's the whole thing. So yeah, I got it. Thank you, Ms. Moiston. Ms. Pat? So I like to, I always like to question status quo. I like to question why this is this way, who gets to make the decision, how it, you know, we, we need in this town to keep questioning things that don't fit right, you know, and anybody can raise it. It doesn't have to come for any particular person. So um, yeah, it's good to volunteer, but the reality is not, not everybody can afford to volunteer for a lot of reasons. So the town need to step in people. I think know, to, we, yeah. we see what happens when yeah. it's on a volunteer basis. That's right. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yes, I agree. And thank you, Ms. Pat. And that that is definitely one of the reasons we, we want to make sure the resident oversight board has funds allotted for their stipend um, and really retention because we want to make sure that they're able to, to stay and that it's sustainable. Um, so I, I do understand the importance of stipends. I'm just wondering though, if it's in within our realm to make the recommendations in regards to the HRC. Why not? Yeah. Okay, so just, well, okay. Um, Ms. Pat? What is our group called again? 
community safety working group. When people feel discriminated against, they don't feel safe, right? That's, you know, part, that's part of a uh, safety issue. Thank you, Ms. Pat. So that's the way I look at it. I, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, more broadly, you know, I'm, I'm defining safety very, very broadly. I'm including psychological safety, emotional safety, physical safety, economic safety, and the, the list goes on. Mental safe, safety as well. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Okay. Alicia, I thought you were gonna say that's why you were running, but you didn't. <laughs> You didn't say that. And I'll just put that plug in there for you. Are we allowed to say that here? I don't know. I've been wanting to say that, but I'm like, you know, we're working, we're working for the town. So it is, it is still, still in the works. Okay. Well, that's hopeful. I, I am in, I am in full agreement though, me personally with everything and that stipends need to be available for all committee. <laughs> I, I am in agreement. We are a radical group and it's all good. It's all good. We need change. Yeah, we need change. Seriously. Mr. Ross, what are you laughing about? I'm cracking you up tonight, right? <laughs> I, I think oh boy. potential, I think potential candidates for uh, office in Amherst should get to choose for themselves when they announce their candidacy or not. I agree. Uh, <laughs> I didn't say that she had to announce. I just said I thought that's it. what she was going to, yeah, that that's what I thought she was going to say after. <laughs> <laughs> just it's she said it right like she said something similar to like and i agree and then there was like almost like a and, and that's why right and so that's what i thought was gonna follow that but it was something completely different so no it's okay Sorry. thank you for my I we have to have, we have a little comicalness going that's on in right these that's right we need it yeah oh, no, i very much enjoy working with you all so this is great. Um, anything else? Um, so um, if everyone's okay to move to the next agenda item, unless there is further discussion um, in regards to this, I would like to move into up and coming events. If anybody has any announcements they would like to make in regards to upcoming events, now would be the time. The so Black Assembly, the I'm not exactly 100, Black Assembly of Amherst, BAM, right? Yeah. Th they have a meeting on Saturday or Sunday. Wait. Saturday. Saturday. Saying it correctly. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Oh, and also, isn't um, Mr. Bockelman is having coffee with the community tomorrow? Oh, Thank you for reminding me that I have to be there for eight o'clock. It's with the community participation officers. So that's myself, Angela Mills, and Brianna Sunreed. Yes. So I think that event is tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. in front of the town hall, if you guys wish to participate in that as well. Um, and then for our next meeting date, uh, I think it will just be next Thursday at 5.30, if that is still working for all the members. We're missing one agenda item. Oh. MS Medium. It's oh. under, uh, oh, yeah. we got to oh, do fine. that under six. Okay, six, okay. Because it, it just came. Yep, yep. Uh, Mr. Vernon Jones. Yeah, I need to say that the next meeting, I will only be able to stay until 7 p.m. Uh -oh. I have another commitment. Okay. But I'll be on from 5.30 to 7. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Vernon Jones, for sharing that. Um, the next agenda item is other topics that um, did not re we did not reasonably anticipate within 48 hours of the meeting. Um, and so I would like to bring up here 
um, the Amherst Media um, announcement and discussing discussing our thoughts and feelings in regards to this article. I'm not sure if everyone was able to read this. Um, Ms. Moisten, is it possible to make it just a tad bit bigger? You met Pat's part. Okay, so. Yeah. Sorry, I was so, reading it because I haven't also read this. So basically, I received an email from MS Media, which looks like uh, a group email or something to other residents that subscribe to, you know, I could be wrong. I don't know. I'm just making an assumption. And I felt that, you know, this is very important, you know, for CSWG to support MS Media and write a letter to town council. Um, or even to the town manager, you know, urging, urging the parties to like pay, you know, pay MS Media. And also it was brought to my attention, not in this letter, and not in this email that um, the town of MS um, never paid MS Media, it's very complicated, but never paid MS Media for the Juneteenth um, coverage of the event. Like MS Media covered the event, but they were not paid. So, you know, um, if we can send, you know, letter offering our support for MS Media. Um, I can make a statement. I um, don't fully understand what is happening with the entire situation with Amherst Media. I did read a few articles um, regarding the situation. Um, and so I think they're being denied funding for their new space that they're moving into so that they can, um, they want to be able to own the building. I don't know if somebody can just clarify that on me, clarify that for me. Um, however, regardless of what the exact situation is, I think that Amherst Media and it functioning is a critical part of our community. And that this is also one of the only ways that things like the town council meeting are broadcasted to the community. And that in terms of access and resources and availability and transparency, that this is something that I, I I do support Amherst Media and that I, I do wish that we could support them, but I, I would just need a better understanding of the situation. So the, the email that I forwarded is what I received. So I forwarded it to everyone. I guess for me, the Juneteenth, more than anything else, um, was supposed to be a special event and the town does come you know, have contracts with MS Media to cover town events, but the Juneteenth is a special event and they were not paid for that. But, you know, covering like town council meetings like that is part of the contract that the town has with MS Media is my understanding. But um, my understanding also is like the Juneteenth event is like additional um, that is not included in the contract, whatever, yeah. So I, I'm going to pretty much stay neutral with this conversation, but what I, because I believe that Amherst Media is, should be more relevant in the Amherst community than what it actually is, unfo unfortunately. Um, but what I will say is there, the energy between the town of Amherst and Amherst Media has been up up and down for many, many years, like all the way back to John Musanti. So I'm not 100% sure where it all started and why it all started. Um, and, you know, what one might say is that they, they, uh, they do have a contract. So as far as it goes with Juneteenth, they would say that that falls underneath the community events that they're supposed to film for the town in the same way that they film I don't know, uh, 
the Veterans or the Memorial Day Parade or any of those other annual events and they don't ask for additional funds. My take on it is that Juneteenth had four locations, so that might be a little tricky. That's what I'll say there. Um, and that they are contracted to receive, and this is, I think this is where the problem is and, and, and I don't know who's gonna be able to give you the best answer, but from what I, when I asked Paul, because I was like, Paul, you can't send me to a meeting where this is gonna be on the agenda and then, then not tell me anything. Like, so uh, what was said was the money that they have that they're saying that they're not giving was supposed to go to equipment. Right, it's for equipment. And when they drew up the contract, they drew up the contract specifically for equipment, not for mortgage. But that is just what I was told. So, so I don't know where you find out the answers to all of this or find a common ground. Um, I would really, I think that Amherst Media is definitely undervalued in our community and could be set upon another level, you know, with everybody could come together and work together. However, that I don't know what has to happen there to have that happen to move Amherst Media to the next level. Thank you, Ms. Marston. Ms. Pat? Ms. Marston, thank you for your comments. So I am wondering, you know, um, perhaps we have not had much time to digest this, wondering if the co-chair will be willing to um, either you know, talk with the, um, the executive director for MS Media. Uh, you know, I'm willing to join you guys too um, because I would really like us to support MS Media uh, to get paid, whatever it is. So that's why I, you know, I, I brought it up. We don't have to decide tonight, maybe next week when we have more people. Um, so. But don't you think they would, and then you have to have a meeting with Paul about it too? That's right, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Pat and Ms. Moise. I, I, I think, I think um, the nature of, so that's why it's so important to have a committed, a com a committee like ours, like that, you know, we're talking about Juneteenth event, MS Media not being compensated. And they reach out, you know, to a member or members, I don't know if they reach out to other people about this. There's a reason for that. They didn't reach out to me just because I'm a, MS resident. I'm sure it has to do with my connection with CSWG. So I felt that I needed to bring it up tonight, you know, for us to decide whether or not to support, you know, them collecting, um, getting paid. And I, and I think it's something we need to really seriously think about because this community have really, really supported us at CSWG. They've really supported us since we formed and we should also extend that uh, to other, other organizations as well. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Mr. Vernon Jones. Yeah, I just wanted to comment that in general, I'm very supportive of Amherst Media. I think it plays a vital function in town. Um, that said, I'm still a little reluctant to take a position as a member of this group without at least hearing something from um, for want of a better term, the other side. Um, it's not that I don't believe Amherst Media's version, but sometimes it's useful to hear both perspectives before you um, choose among them. And I'd just like to know a little more about what the town's position is on this. Uh, because reading this, it certainly seems logical that uh, uh, it would be a good, a good investment and good use of the money for it to go to Amherst Media as they propose here. But I'd, I'd like to hear more of the whole situation. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Um, sorry, Ms. Owen. Yeah, I just think that um, as co-chairs, maybe Alicia and I and Ms. Pat, if we have the time this week, could meet with the executive director from Amherst Media and bring back more information to the group and make sure Mr. Bachelman is at our next meeting and bring it up so we have more information. Thank you, Ms. Ellen. Ms. Pat? Yeah, I agree with what everybody have said tonight. I wasn't expecting us to make a decision tonight. 
Um, I do agree we need to hear from both sides. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, we should get uh, side, the side of uh, town managers story and also uh, from MS Media so we get more information. I agree, yep. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Um, I'm also in agreement and I am okay with um, meeting with the director of Amherst Media um, in regards to this to get more information to bring back to the group because uh, I do think it would be important and that we would need to be a little bit more knowledgeable to be able to write a, a good letter of support. And I'm wondering if you all think it's necessary to invite Mr. Balcom into our next meeting for those purposes or if this is something that Brianna and I can add to our list of things to discuss with him at our, our meeting. Miss Pat? If it's okay with everybody, I think it will save a lot of time. If you guys are already planning to meet with him, I will very much support to bring that up with him. I don't need to be there, yeah. Thank you, Miss Pat. Are, are there any other um, Mr. Vernon Jones? I think if our chairs, our co-chairs can handle the situation, um, we, I, with all due respect, I don't think it has always been the most efficient way for us to do our business to have the town manager with us. Um, and uh, so if, if something co-chairs can handle, I think that would be great. You want to join them? No, thank you. <laughs> You're doing a lot already. <laughs> you are doing a lot, you know. Um, thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones, and thank you, Ms. Pat. I, I think that this is perfectly within reach given that we are planning to reach out to him for a meeting anyways, um, and that it's really feasible to just add this to our list of things for the discussion, um, and that Brianna and I will reach out to Mr. Bockelman in hopes of meeting as soon as possible so that we can get that information back to you all. Um, and so that we can move forward. Um, okay, are there any other topics that were not reasonably anticipated within 48 hours of this meeting that you all would like to go over at this time? Okay, so I just wanna do a quick summary or overview of the meeting before we adjourn tonight, um, just so that we can all be on the same page for next week. Um, so next week we will be doing a little bit more formal updates in regards to our um, research of our groups of our, I, they're not subgroups, but I don't know what else you would call them. Um, and that I would suggest or recommend that we all take a look at the questions that Mr. Vernon Jones sent us um, and see if we could just have an idea as to our feelings in regards to those so that we can facilitate a conversation about them at our next meeting. Um, I don't know if there was anything else that I would want everyone to look at for next meeting, but just to continue outside research and that once we get more information from Mr. Bockelman that then we can make decision in terms of the other um, topics we discussed tonight. And Ms. Pat? Just for you and the co-chair to remember to uh, contact uh, Mr. Albrod that we will not be meeting with him, right? Oh, I thought that was tabled till the next meeting. Uh, oh, tabled, okay. People were gone. I'm thinking ahead of, never mind, okay. Yes, oh, I apologize. Um, thank you, Ms. Pat, and thank you, Ms. Moiston. So we did table that for next meeting okay. just so that all all members can be hopefully present at next meeting and we can bring that back up to make a decision. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. No, no problem. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have any other suggested agenda items for next? I feel I, I'm just kind of doing the making the agenda. And so I <laughs> feel like I don't have enough input from the members. Um, do you guys have things that you might want to add to next week's agenda? I think if we could have a conversation on um, the membership for the resident oversight board, because hopefully we'll have more people here so next week. Are we going to do a complete conversation about ROB and then that's like a subtopic? Is that how we're going to do that? I think so, yeah. I think in the beginning of the meeting, Alicia and I should report to the group how the meeting with Mr. Bockelman went and share the answers for how much money we may have for consultants, the money within reach for the resident oversight board, 
how we can be involved with the police vacancy hiring and to learn more about the budget for Crest. Because once we have those answers, I feel like we'll be able to have a better conversation on the resident oversight board and even traffic control and community policing. Right, I'll send something out again in the beginning of next week. Okay, great. Okay, um, and so does anybody have any final comments they would like to make before I call the meeting to adjourn? Miss Owen and then Miss Pat. We finished between before 7:30. I'm so proud of us. <laughs> That's exactly what I wanted to say. Woo! That's exactly what I want to say. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So with that being said, thank you all for your participation tonight. And I um, call this meeting to adjourn. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everybody.